We're starting with a hideous intro. Good job, Brock. Anyway. <sighs> Good evening, friends. <laughs> Thank you for joining me this evening. What? Yes. Good evening, friends. Thank you for joining me this evening. Tonight we are going to be experiencing two, two very good stories from the wonderful Edgar Allan Poe. I'm going to be reading you first The Mask of the Red Death, and then we will have a short intermission, and then I will read for you uh, The Telltale Heart. So... Let's begin, shall we? The Mask of the Red Death The Red Death had long devastated the country. No pestilence had ever been so final or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal. The redness and the horror of blood, there were sharp pains and sudden dizziness and then profuse bleeding at the pores with disillusion. The scarlet stains upon the body and especially the face of the victim, where the pest ban, which was shut out from the aid and from the sympathy of his fellow men, and the whole seizure, progress, and termination of the disease were the incidents of half an hour. But the Prince Prospero was happy and dauntless and sagacious. When his dominions were half depopulated, he summoned to his presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends, from among the knights and dames of his court. With these, retired to the deep seclusion of one of his castellated abbeys. This was an extensive and magnificent structure, the creation of the prince's own eccentric, eccentric yet august taste. A strong and lofty wall girdled it. This wall had gates of iron. The courtiers, having entered, brought furnaces and massy hammers and welded the bolts. They resolved to leave. Oops, sorry. They resolved to leave means neither of ingress or egress to the sudden impulses of despair, or of frenzy from within. The abbey was amply provisioned, with which pr such precautions the courtiers might bid defiance to contagion. The external. Sorry, I'm just just scrolling here. The external world could take care of itself. In the meantime, it was fully to grieve or to think. The prince had provided all the appliances of pleasure. There were buffoons, there were improvisatory, there were ballet dancers, there were musicians, there was beauty, there was wine. All these and security were within. Without was the Red Death. It was Toward the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion, and while the pestilence raged most furiously abroad, that the Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends at a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence. It was a voluptuous scene, that masquerade, that masquerade, but first let me tell of the rooms in which it was held. There were seven. An imperial suite in many palaces, However, such suites form a long and straight vista, while the folding doors slide back nearly to the walls on either hand, so that the view of the whole extent is scarcely impeded. Here the case was very different. As might have been expected, from the Duke's love of the bazaar, the apartments were so irregularly disposed that the vision embraced but little more than one at a time. There was a sharp turn at every twenty or thirty yards, and at each turn a novel effect. To the right and left in the middle of each wall, a tall and narrow gothic window looked out upon a closed corridor, which pursued the windings of the suite. These windows were of stained glass, whose color varied in accordance with the prevailing hue of the decorations of the chamber, into which it opened. That at the eastern extremity was hung, for example, in blue, and vividly blue were its windows. The second chamber was purple in its ornaments and tapestries, and here the panes were purple. The third was throughout and so 
was green th throughout, and so were the casements. The fourth with, was furnished and lighted with orange, the fifth with white, the sixth with violet, and the seventh apartment was closely shrouded in black velvet tapestries that hung all over the ceiling and down the walls, falling in on heavy folds upon a carpet of the same material and hue. But in this chamber only, the color of the windows failed to correspond with the decorations. The panes here were scarlet. A, excuse me. A deep blood color. Now, in no one of the seven apartments was there any lamp or candelabrum. Amid the profusion of golden ornaments that lay scattered to and fro, or, de or depended from the floor from from the roof. There was no light of any kind emanating from lamp or candle within the suite of chambers. But in the corridors that followed the suite, there stood opposite to each window a heavy tripod bearing a bra brazier of fire that projected its rays through the tinted glass and so glaringly illuminated the room. And thus were produced a multitude of gaudy and fantastic appearances. But in the western or black chamber, the effect of the fire light through that streamed upon the dark hangings through the blood-tinted panes was ghastly in the extreme, and produced so wild a look upon the countenance of those who entered that there were few of the company bold enough to set foot within its precincts at all. It was in this apartment, also, that there stood against the western wall a gigantic clock of ebony, its pendulum swung to and fro with a dull, heavy, monotonous clang, and when the minute hand made the circuit of the face, the hour was to be stricken. There came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound which was clear and loud and deep and exceedingly musical, but of so peculiar a note and emphasis that, at each lapse of an hour, the musicians of the orchestra were con constrained to pause momentarily in their performance to hearken to the sound. And thus the waltzers perforce ceased their evolutions, and there was a brief disconcert of the whole gay company. And while the chimes of the clock yet rang, it was observed that the giddiest grew pale, and the more aged and sedate passed their hands over their brows as if in confused reverie or meditation. But when the echoes had fully ceased, a light laughter at once pervaded the assembly. The musicians looked at each other and smiled as if to their own nervous folly and made whispering vows to each other that the next chiming of the clock should produce in them no similar emotion. And then, after the lapse of 60 minutes, which embraced 3,600 seconds of the time that flies, there came yet another chiming of the clock and then there were the same disconcert and tremulous meditations as before. But in spite of these things, it was a gay and magnificent revel. The tastes of the Duke were peculiar. He had a fine eye for colors and effects. He had disregarded the decora of mere fashion. His plans were bold and fury. His conceptions glowed with barbaric luster. There are some who would have thought him mad. His followers felt that he was not. Necessary to hear and see the touch. It was necessary to see and hear and touch him to be sure that he was not. He had directed, in great part, the movable embellishments of the seven chambers. Upon occasion of this great fete, and it was his own guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders. Be sure they were grotesque. They were much, there were much glare and glitter and piquancy and phantasm, much of what has been, has been since seen in Hernani. There were arabesque figures that, with unsuited limbs and appointments. There were delirious fancies, such as the madman fashions. There was much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, something of the terrible, and not a little of that which might have been excited disgust. To and fro in the seven chambers there stalked, in fact, a multitude of dreams. And these dreams, the dreams writhed in and about, taking hue from the rooms and causing the wild music of the orchestra to seem as the echo of their steps. 
and anon there strikes the ebony clock, which, which stands in the hall of the velvet. And then there, for a moment, all is still, and all is silent, save the voices of the clock. The dreams are stiff frozen as they stand, but the echoes of the chime die away. They have endured but an instant, and a light, half-subdued laughter floats after them as they depart. And now again, the music swells, the dreams live, and writhe to and fro more merrily than ever, taking hue from the many tinted windows through which stream the rays from the tripods. But to the chamber which lies most westwardly of the seven, there are now none of the maskers who venture, for the night is waning away, and there flows a ruddier light through the blood-colored panes, and the blackness of the sable drapery appalls, and to him whose footfalls upon the sable carpet there comes from near the clock of ebony, a muffled peal more solemnly emphatic than any which reaches their ears who indulge in the more remote gaieties of the other apartments. But these apartments, these other apartments, were densely crowded, and in them beat feverishly the heart of life, and the revel went swirlingly on, until at length there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock. Then the music ceased, as I have told, and the evolutions of the waltzers were quieted, and there was an uneasy cessation of all things as before. But now there were twelve strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock, Pardon me. I scrolled too far. Where'd it go? Sorry, I'm just, uh, keep the life. Where are we? Horror. No, we've gone too far. Stream the rays of travel. Music. Ah, yes. And then the music ceased, as I have told, and the evolutions of the waltzers were quieted, and there was an uneasy cessation of all things. But now there were twelve strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock, and thus it happened, perhaps, that more of thought crept, with more of time, into the meditations of the thoughtful among those who reveled. And thus, too, it happened, perhaps, that before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence, there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the pres presence of a masked figure which had arrested the attention of no single individual before. And the rumor of this new presence, having spread itself whisperingly around, there arose at length from the whole company a buzz or murmur, expressive of disapprobation and surprise, then finally of terror, of horror, and of disgust. In an assembly of phantasms, such as I have painted, it may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance could well have excited such sensation. In truth, the masquerade license of the night was nearly unlimited, but the figure in question had out heroded Herod, and gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. There are chords in the heart of the most reckless which cannot be touched without emotion. Even with the utterly lost to whom life and death are equally jests, there are matters of which no jest can be made. The whole company indeed seemed now deeply to feel that in the costume and bearing of the stranger, neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliment, habiliments of the grave. The mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in the, detection, the detecting the cheat. And yet all this might have been endured, if not approved by the mad revelers around. But the mummer had gone so far as to assume the type of the Red Death. His vesture was daubled in blood, and his broad brow, which all the features of the face, with all the features of the face, was 
besprinkled, besprinkled with the scarlet horror. When the eyes of Prince Prospero fell upon the spectral image, which, with a slow and solemn movement, as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the revelers, he was seen to be convulsed, in the first moment with a strong shudder either of terror or distaste, but in the next his brow reddened with rage. "'Who dares?' he demanded hoarsely of the courtiers who stood near him. "'Who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him, that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements.' It was in the eastern or blue chamber in which stood the Prince Prospero as he uttered these words. They rang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly, for the Prince was a bold and robust man. The music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. <clears throat> it was in the blue room where stood the Prince, with a group of pale courtiers by his side. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing of movement of this group in the direction of the intruder, who at the moment was also near at hand, and now with deliberate and stately step made closer approach to the speaker. But from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the mummer had inspired the whole party, there were found none who put forth the hand to seize him, so that unimpeded he passed within a yard of the prince's person, and while the vast assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centers of the rooms to the walls he made his way uninterruptingly but with the same solemn and measured step which had distinguished him from the first through the blue chamber to the purple through the purple to the green through the green to the orange through this again to the white and even thence to the violet or a decided movement ere a decided movement had been made to arrest him it was then however that the Prince Prospero, maddening with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers, while none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all, he bore aloft a drawn dagger, and had approached, in rapid impetuosity, to within three or four feet of the retreating figure. When the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confront confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry, and the dagger dropped gleaming upon the sable carpet, upon which instantly afterwards fell prostrate in death the Prince Prospero. Then, summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng of the revelers at once threw themselves into the black apartment, and seizing the mummer, whose, the mummer, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped gasped in unutterable horror at finding the grave cerements and corpse-like mask which they handled with so violent a rudeness untenanted by any tangible form and now was acknowledged the presence of the red death he had come like a thief in the night and one by one dropped the revelers in the bloody bed bedewed halls of their revel revel and died each in the despairing posture of this fall and the life of the ebony clock went out with that of the last of the gay, and the flames of the tripods expired, and the darkness and decay and the red death held illimitable, illimitable dominion over all. All right, and that was the mask of the red death. That was a pretty good one. Next we will be going over the Telltale Heart, the next in the series by one Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, ooh, I'm just having a little bit of trouble getting my ooh, <laughs> my book to uh, cooperate with me here. I'm going to take a moment just to move my my head very strangely, and then I will change the book manually. Thank you. All right, we are back in business. If anybody uh, made it in here after the 
the lovely air that I had <laughs> had with the the first stream that I started up uh, when I double clicked the start button and it clicked right through to cancel. So I had to start start a new one. If you made it through, I thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and if you are watching this from the future again, I appreciate your your time. Uh, I'm just here just here reading some stories. So we're going to we're going to get. Uh, Actually, I'm going to take one more quick pause just to have a, a brief sip of tea, and then we will we will begin into the uh, the Telltale Heart. Just give me a quick shake, shake, and we will we will get going. third person self back there again all right and with that my uh I'm a, I'm a little bit wettened up again and i think i'm ready to read read another story so we will uh we will start in on the telltale heart <clears throat> true nervous very very dreadfully nervous i had been and am but why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how the first idea en entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object there was none. Passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold I had no desire. I think, I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture. A pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of that eye forever. Now, this is the point. You fancy me mad. Bad men know nothing, but you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded with, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh so gently, and then when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed that no light sh shone out, and then I thrust in my head. Oh, and you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the room so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. Ha! Would a madman have been as wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, oh, so cautiously, cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single, thin, a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And thus I did for seven long nights. Every night, just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed. So it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me. But his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber. 
and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he passed the night. So you see, he would have been very profound, a very profound old man indeed, to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than unusually cautious in the opening of the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my own sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there was, there I was, opening the door, little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved in on the bed suddenly, as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room is as black as pitch, with the thick darkness, for the shutters were close, fastened, through the fear of robbers. So And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I c kept pushing it on steadily. I had my head in, and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening, and the old man sprang up in bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept quiet, quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed listening, just as I have done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently, I heard a slight groan and knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief, oh no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt, and I pitied him. Although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise, when he had, been when he had turned in his bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor, or it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain. All in vain, because death, in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him, and it enveloped, enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down I resolved to open a little, a very, very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily until at length a single, simple, dim ray, like the thread of a spider, shot out from the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctiveness, all a dull blue, with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct, precisely upon the damned spot. And I have not told you that what you mistake for madness is but 
over acuteness of the sense. Now, I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes, one enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was beating, it was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury. As the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage, but even yet I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held upon, held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker, and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder. I say louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous. So I am. And now, at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrolled terror. Yet... For some minutes longer I refrained and stood still, but the beating grew louder and louder. I thought the heart must burst, and now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once, once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done, but for many minutes the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone stone dead. I then placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eyes would trouble me. His eye would trouble me no more. If you still think me mad, <clears throat> you will think so no longer when I described the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night had waned. I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head, and then the arms, and the legs, and then I took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the boards so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot, whatever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught it all. Ha ha! When I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded, the hour... <laughs> as the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the door, down... at the street down. Came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart. For what had I now to fear? there entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police officer, police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled for what had I to fear? A braid, I bade the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own, in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I 
took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure and undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chattered of familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a, a ringing in my ears. But still they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definitiveness until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice yet the sound increased. What could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound. Much such a noise as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath. And yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles. And in a high key, and with violent gest gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the f floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if to excite the fury, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men. But the noise steadily increased. Oh God, what could I do? I foamed. I raved, I swore, I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards. But the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder and louder and louder and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no, no. They heard, they suspected. They knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and, and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could, I could bear those hypocrit hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt what I must scream or die. And now, again, hark, louder, louder, louder. Villains, I shrieked. Dissemble no more! I admit the deed! Tear up the planks! Here! Here! It is the beating of his hideous heart! <laughs> that was fun. That was a that was a, a good story. So, well, that was That was uh Edgar Allan Poe's Telltale Heart. What a what an exciting tale of of murder and and guilt. <laughs> it, it undoes people in the end. It sure does. So anyway, I, uh, I don't, uh, I don't know. I guess, I guess, I guess I'll have to wind this to a close. If you've, if you've uh, joined me for both stories, I, I thank you very heartily for, for joining me this evening. I will, uh, I will probably be doing another storytelling evening with myself, Brock, once again, uh, at some point in, in the future. I'm not 100% not sure when, but I will try to uh, do this as, as much as possible. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun, and I'm going to try to make it a habit. So thank you. Thank you again. And uh, I guess 
that's it for the evening. Take care.